further ado, I want to welcome uh, Lori first and with Forte Organizers. Thank, thank you. you so much, I Lori. Have my own mic. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, when the gentleman came up here to make his announcement, I, I was listening and I thought, I could have sworn he just said spit. And then I heard him say spit. That's really what you meant. You should, did you see all their faces when you said that? You were all like, huh. Anyway, I came earlier. I'm not going to make you spit, by the way. Please don't spit while, while I'm doing my presentation. But I came earlier today uh, just to start you know, meeting with you and getting to know some of you. And the saying that um, good things come in small packages, that's true after meeting some of you today. And uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I have a small package in my own home. Uh, one of my children, she's 5'2". Now, I know for some of you, you're thinking that's not a small package. But in our family, she is the shortest in our family. Of all the cousins and aunts and, you know, aunts and uncles, she is the shortest in the family. And she loves it. She sees no disadvantages in being short. And so I actually text her this morning, knowing I was coming in here. And I say, you've always embraced your shortness. Why? What, what, what is it about it that you love so much? So I'm going to read you her text. She says, um, I don't feel like I'm short when I'm with my friends. I feel pretty average height overall. I never have to worry about being too tall when I wear heels. And the girl loves to rock heels, let me tell you. <laughs> Guys are always taller than me. Now, she's 21, so to give you some insight here, so what's important to her right now? Guys are always taller than me, and I can wear kids' shoes and clothes. And that is so true. I will come home with a pair of running shoes that I've spent, you know, $115 on. She'll turn around, go right online, and get the kids' size for $40, $50 cheaper than what I was able to buy in the adult size. So she is constantly getting exactly what I got for much, much less money, and she loves it. Now, of course, uh, my youngest daughter, who is now just a tad bit taller than her, so I have a 21-year-old at 5'2", and I have a 12-year-old at 5', probably right around 5'2", she loves it, too, because she can sneak into her closet now when she's off to college and wear everything. Of course, I don't necessarily want my 12-year-old wearing what my 21-year-old wears, so to speak, but she does fit in her shoes and everything, and she has to be very careful, this social media, when, you're, when you borrow or both well, borrow someone else's things and then you start doing Facebook and all, they actually catch you in their Ugg shoes, <laughs> Ugg boots. That happens all the time. I'll get a text or a call. Mom, she's got my shoes on. I'm like, how do you know this? <laughs> but anyway, so embrace your shortness, so to speak. Good things do come in small packages. Um, you know, when I arrived today, I wasn't sure if I was at a conference or a party. I'm like, what, what is this? I go to conferences all the time. In fact, I'm going to one tomorrow, uh, my own speaker conference. I'm going to Arizona. And I can guarantee you, we will not have a milkshake maker when I arrive. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, on the evaluation, milkshake maker is going right on my evaluation. I want the guy in the little paper hat at my next conference when I go to it. But isn't it awesome when you can get into a room of people that share a likeness with you? They just, yes. Yes, I didn't expect so much applause. They just get you. And so when I go to my speakers conference for the fi next five days, I'm going to be in rooms full of speakers, and they just get me. They get my challenges. They get my joys. They support me in so many ways. And so how many first timers do we have here today? Just raise your hand if you're a first timer. OK, great. Wow. That's fantastic. <clears throat> And so one of the things that I definitely love when I go to a conference, because I also go to an um, organizer conference as well. Can you imagine a room full of organizers? That is just a weird place to be, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I love in being those groups is the support that I get when I'm there. So could you raise your hand if you're willing to give those new timers today the support they need, whether it's an ear to listen to, or a shoulder to cry on, or some joyful thing they want to share. Raise your hand in this room if you would be willing to be a support to those people if they needed to walk up to you and talk to you today. Excellent. So all my first timers, please look around at who just raised their hands. They are people that are here for you this whole weekend, just for you. So make sure you check them out as well. So our program today, who will win, you or your stuff? As an organizer for 10 years, I'm finding that people's stuff is winning the game. 
And it's time that we start taking our lives back, start living our lives the way we want to, and stop letting society tell us we need to buy more stuff. Because I think that's one of the culprits, is we're, we, society, as a society, we think, hey, that person is more successful if they have more things or more expensive things than I do. And a success is definitely not defined by things. So I want, to, I, I want to talk today about how can we take back the power over this stuff and live our lives differently. So if you feel like you're alone in this cluttered world of ours, you are not. We are all struggling with having too many things. I went to church one morning and walked in, and this is what I saw up there on the altar. I just a sign that spelled out stuff in cardboard boxes. And immediately I thought, we're not alone in this room. If our church is running a whole six-week program on people having too much stuff, then it's not just us in this room that has this problem going on. And so I'm just going to sh share with you some tips and things today. But my ultimate goal is to get you thinking differently about your stuff. If I walk off this stage and all of you just think differently about your things, even if you don't go back and do something right away, I just want this pouring into your mind right now about thinking differently about stuff and to know you're not alone in that thinking when you leave this room. So what is a professional organizer? I do go into people's homes and I go into people's offices and I get to see them before guests arrive. You know, everyone always runs around and cleans up and pushes things under their bed and hides things behind closed doors before the guests arrive. But I always ask my clients not to do that. I know, it's hard. Wouldn't that be hard to let someone, a stranger, come into your home and see it just as you see it all the time? And because of that, I know a lot of the reasons why you're struggling, and I have put solutions in place as a result. But my biggest thing as an organizer, and you have this on your handout today, either you can start filling it in as I'm talking, or you can just think about it for a little while, is to get people to think differently about their things. And so when I enter their homes or their offices, I, uh, I, I see stuff. Now, I see stuff that they need to use right now, but I see a lot of stuff from their history. Their homes are filled with things from what they've been doing, and that's great. I need to know what your history is. But what I'm more interested in is about where are you headed? All of you have a bucket list that you still want to check off, things that you still want to accomplish. And I get excited about that bucket list and finding out what your goals are and where you're trying to still get to. So I'm all about living over here. Your past is important. Yeah, it's your past. It's your life. But it's not your life right now. And so I get people to start thinking about goals. And when I sometimes bring that up, some people, sadly enough, say, I don't have any goals. I'm like, sure you do. Everyone has goals. And so sometimes I just start asking them questions, and instantly I start hearing their goals. And one of those is, who do you want to spend more time with? Who do you want to spend more time this, with? We only all, all of us, only have so much time left on this earth. Who do you want to spend your time with? Who do you want to invest your time with moving forward? What experiences do you still want to have? What is still on your bucket list that you say time and time again that you're going to do someday? I want to make your someday happen a lot sooner than maybe what you're thinking and start checking those things off your bucket list. And we can do some of those things by getting more organized. And finally, on a daily basis, what just makes you happy? When you figure out what just makes you happy on a regular basis, you're going to start surrounding yourself with the things that you need and love and that make you happy on a regular basis. And that's my goal for today, is to get you thinking about how does my stuff help me reach these goals, this stuff on my bucket list, the people that are important to me? How is my stuff going to help me get there? Or more importantly, how can it keep me from reaching these goals that I have for myself? So just a typical before and after. You guys love before and after pictures, right? I'll just give you one here. Um, I go into offices. This happens to be a school. This is a school principal. So I don't know if you've ever seen your principal's office. I know when I was younger, I did not want to see the principal's office. 
But as an adult now, I've worked with several principals in their offices. And it's, you know, I walk in and I find out what their challenges are. So one of her challenges was, I leave everything out because if I put it away, I forget about it. So OK, that's one challenge that I need to overcome is I will put things away, but you'll have a reminder system. And we're going to learn some of those things in the next session as well. So that's the before, and here's the after. This is just after an afternoon of working together in her office. So not even overnight did this happen. This quick change happened in a matter of hours uh, because she was ready to make a difference. She was ready to change. She said, you know, I have people come into my office, teachers, so my staff comes in here, students come in here, and their parents come in here. And I want to make sure that I'm giving the right image portraying the right image as the professional woman that I am. And she is a professional woman. And I think this office you know, say, states that a little more. So gold checked off. She looks more, this office helps her look more professional in the long run. So a lot of people also ask me, what's the worst case you've ever seen? And I think sometimes I ask that just to make sure that their house is not the worst case I've ever seen <laughs> when I pull up into their driveway. And so I have been on both the shows, as uh, Sean just said, Hoarders and Hoard Hoarder Buried Alive. I'm guessing some of you watch those shows? Yeah. Yes, right? Uh, and are you watching them because you, you turn it off and you go, well, at least I'm not that bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> at least I'm not like her, OK? Well, I worked with those people. And I have to tell you, on one, one side over here, we can judge them and say, what's wrong with you? But when you come over here and you really talk with someone who's dealing with a hoarding situation, you find out their backstory. And their backstories can really explain why their houses get to look like they do. And you can start uh, having compassion for them and suddenly take your judgmental hat off. And that's what I have to do every day in my business. I have to set my judgments aside because I always know there's an underlying reason, there's an underlying story that each and every one of us have. And until we understand that story, I have a hard time helping people until I grasp that. So uh, you know, as we see the pictures, it's, it, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, who could possibly live like this? So this one is very dark. And the reason why, I couldn't even get to a light bulb to change in the room until I started working in the room more. But this particular client that I worked with on the hoarder show had not slept in a real bed for years. She was honestly, I know, isn't that sad that to say today to think that someone doesn't have a real bed to sleep in at night? She was just sleeping on a pile of clothes. And the first thing I told the team, because I suddenly had a whole team to work with. When you have TV shows and cameras and all this, I have a whole team ahead of me. And I said, OK, the first order of business is to make a bedroom for this woman. I don't care what else we get done today. I want her to sleep in a bed tonight. The bed was somewhere in the house. We didn't quite know where it was. We had to find it. But over, you know, within that day, she had a bed and a place to sleep. And I thought it was so sweet. One of her friends instantly ran out and bought her a brand new bedspread to sleep in that night. And so as I say, you, on one hand, you can judge somebody. But when you hear their story, all you want to have for them is compassion and helping them and supporting them to move forward. And so this woman got to have a bed overnight uh, to sleep in that night. Because I said she had a lot of work ahead of her to do, and everyone deserves a bed. And I also believe when you change your environment, you change your opportunities. And so when I go in to help someone get organized, one of the things that I hear them say is, I feel so much more confident now. And someone who has more confidence can be so much more successful. So as an organizer, people think I just go in and I move a few things around. But it's so much more than just the physical things that I see in front of me. It's the person in front of me. The stuff is secondary. And so by changing their environment, often they soar after we get them more organized. So the average American spends 55 minutes a day looking for things they own but cannot find. Is that anyone in this room by chance? <laughs> looking for your cell phone, looking for your keys, looking for that school report you were supposed to turn in? Yes, 55 minutes a day. That's just the average American. I have some clients who would tell me they spend a lot more time than that every day. And so if you round that up to an hour a day, that's seven hours a week that you are spending just looking for things. Seven hours a week. I think that is so sad. Because when you're looking for things, are you happy? 
No, right? No, you're frustrated. Sometimes you're screaming your head off. Sometimes you're yelling at someone else. And before you know it, sometimes a whole household can be looking for your thing. And everyone starts getting upset and frustrated. So in some cases, we're spending seven hours a week being frustrated and yelling at each other. That's sad. We need to stop that. We need to realize that our stuff is not that important, that people are important, that we're important, and we have to let some of that go. People will ask me, how do you find the time to work a full-time job? I own my own company, so it's even more sometimes than just a full-time job. I have five children. I work out. I belong to a couple of book clubs. I get to do all of those things. And they say, how do you fit that all in? Well, when you think about it, I get that extra day a week that we all say, if I just had one more day, I would be able to do these things. So getting organized for me is not about being perfect. It's about finding my things so I don't spend seven hours just looking for things. I get to do so many other things every single week because I'm not looking for things. And that's what I want for you guys as well. So our topics today, the seasons of life, and then decision-making questions. How do, we get, how do we get a handle on all of this? So people just think I go into your homes and I throw things away. It doesn't help when they often see me on the back of a dumpster, such as they took this picture here. Who wants a picture of themselves on the back of a dumpster? But anyway, um, but I'm not there just to throw your things away. Because if I would do that to you, if I would trick you or hide things from you and get rid of them, you would have learned nothing. And in six months' time, I can guarantee you, your home would look like I never even was there and touched anything because you didn't learn anything. Plus, if I just started going in and throwing things away, your anxiety level would be so high that that's what happens on those shows, isn't it? Don't you see the anxiety level reach high on the, when you watch the hoarder shows and things? It's because we're dealing with stuff instead of a person. When we stop and think about that person, what are they dealing with? So I'm not there to get rid of, I'm not there to trick you into getting rid of your things because you'll just get like that again in six months. What I'm there to do is to get you thinking differently about your things. And when you do that, either the dumpster here or the donate truck next to it starts filling up because you've changed. I haven't changed you. You've changed within with the suggestions that I've been giving. So don't think that I'm just there to throw your things away. People are often afraid to have me come to their homes because that's what they fear. Instead, I get you thinking differently. So back in 2010, I was opening my daily paper and reading, and I came across Jay here. Jay lives in a 96-square-foot home, the little home you see behind him. Now, for those of you who may be challenged like I was, 96 square foot didn't really necessarily mean anything to me. I thought, OK, that's small, but how small? So where the cars are parked in the parking lot, on the space, not the whole lot, just where a car would fit on a parking space, is where his house would fit. You could move a car out and put his house there. And that's where he lives. So when I picked up the article, it says here, um, in a tough economy, Americans are downsizing in all kinds of ways. And I thought, in a tough economy, something's happened to him. He's lost his job. His health has declined. Something's going on with him that has forced him to live in this small house. And so when I first started the read, reading the article, I felt really bad for him that this economy back in 2010 had possibly wiped out his bigger home and has forced this on him. And I started reading, and I started reading some more. And then I discovered that there were things that he got to do as a result of living in such a small house. So now this is going to be a part of the shout-out. This is a shout-out part of this program. I'm going to need to hear from some of you. Do we have someone with a microphone in the audience? Right here, and your name is? Carol. Carol will be running around as you raise your hand. Probably not going to be able to get to everyone in the back unless you just happen to stay in the back, back there. But could you shout out to me what you think Jay gets to do as a result of having such a small house to manage? Vacation. He gets to take vacations, OK? Because he doesn't have a whole lot to take care of, right? He can just close the door and leave. <clears throat> He gets to read more. OK, so we have a reader in the group. I'm a reader, too. One of my vacations would be just to go in the backyard and read without guilt. Wouldn't you just love to read without guilt? 
Read, nap, read, nap. That would be an ideal day for me. Whatever his favorite hobby is. OK, so whatever his favorite hobby is, he could get to do that. He just closed the door, do, 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 go and do what he wants to do. He would, save a lot, he would save a lot of money. OK, so he'd also save a lot of money. Therefore, he'd have more money to spend on the vacations that we want to take or the hobbies that he has an interest in. How about one more right here? Save time cleaning. OK, so he'd save time cleaning. Excellent, less time cleaning. So that was going to be my next question. What doesn't he have to do? We just heard what he gets to do. What doesn't he have to do as a result of living in a smaller home? I still need you, Carol. <laughs> She's going to get her Olympic workout today. Right back here. And you can just shout it. We might, I might be able to hear you anyway. What, does, what doesn't he have to do? Spend a lot of money refurbishing the house. OK, so once he get it, gets it decorated, He's done. He can now go off and do his hobbies and have vacation and save all that money because it doesn't, doesn't take to much to turn on the TV to check the weather. The, he doesn't have to turn on the TV to check the weather because he's probably spending some time outside. That's a new one. I've never. There's always, always a smart aleck in my group. I think I found him. <laughs> can you guys help me keep an eye on that one? He's going to be trouble. He doesn't necessarily have to stay in one place. OK, so he doesn't necessarily have to stay in one place. Excellent. How about two more? He doesn't have to work um, all the time or work okay. a lot of overtime. Maybe he can work part-time. Excellent. Like so possibly you could even just have a part-time job because he doesn't have to spend so much money on utilities and a larger home and furnishing a larger home. So he might have more time for those vacations and more time for those hobbies. And of course, he has the money to do it. How about one more? He doesn't have to be overwhelmed when there's a when there's things in his home because okay. it's a lot easier. So when easier. he opens his door, he doesn't have to feel so overwhelmed. He's not spending a Saturday organizing his home, his basement, his garage, is he? He's not doing that. I think you can sit down at least for a little while, Carol. Thank you so much. A hand for Carol. Come on. <laughs> I didn't even warn her to eat her Wheaties this morning either. So when I started reading the article, I thought, poor guy. By the time I got done with the article, I started feeling Poor me. Poor me that has to live in such a big house with those five children and spouse of mine. Poor me, because I just don't have the money to run and go on vacations. I have to actually work full time, and I don't always get to do my hobbies. And the only time I get to read without feeling guilty is right before I go to sleep at night, because no one's looking for me. That's the only time. So I started out feeling sorry for him. I ended up feeling sorry for myself. And so I was down, honestly, about this for a while. A couple weeks of just kind of moping around. And I just kept thinking, how can I get rid of those people that live with me? <laughs> and of course, that wasn't going to work. I, I knew I had to keep them in the long run. So, so I, I wasn't going to get rid of them, meaning I couldn't go live in my own 96 square foot house, because how awesome would that be getting to do all these things? And so I was moping for a while. And then an idea came to me. Even though I live in a much larger house, I could maintain a 96 square foot mentality within that home. And so I started selling and donating and giving away most of my things that I no longer needed. This stuff from my history started going out the door. The stuff that took up a lot of my time, such as the hot tub we had in the backyard that we were hardly ever using, I was done cleaning those things. I wanted more vacation time and spending time reading and having my hobbies and saving money by not even buying chemicals for that darn thing anymore. So since 2010, I've started thinking of 96 square foot mentality and letting go of things. And I'm happy to report to you six years later I have less in my life than I've ever had, and I am a happier person as a result. I do get to go on vacation because I have my own job. I can sneak things in. I definitely get to read. I usually have two books going at a time at any time. I get to work out. I get to do my hobbies, which I love riding bikes. I love being outside in general. My closets are no longer overstuffed. My laundry room isn't filled up as full as it could be. I actually have empty drawers and dressers because I started thinking of a 96 square foot mentality. And if these people would ever leave, I'm ready to downsize today. Not because I have to, but because I want to. 
someday I want to maybe not 96 square feet. That's pushing it a little bit. Unless he added a walk-in closet, I might consider it. But that's probably not really practical for me in the long run. But it's definitely something that I've, I've really started thinking about. And since I changed my life to start living more like a J, I guarantee you I'm happier and I'm healthier as a result from doing that. And this is catching on all across the country now. We are starting to have this small town uh, mentality where we're having neighborhoods built with these smaller homes. And I picked this particular one to show you today because as I read the article about this small town, they, the people in these homes chose to have uh, a porch on every one of their homes instead of more square footage inside the home. What kind of sense of community is that is when people already in such small quarters give up even more small quarters so that they can be outside on their porch greeting and talking with their neighbors. I want to move into a neighborhood just like that. Because we have neighbors now, I don't personally, but I know people who have neighbors that don't even know their neighbors in the long run. So we're going to start talking about living in your season. All of us are, go are in a season right now. And you can call that a stage of your life, a phase of your life. I'm just going to call it seasons today. And get ready, Carol, because I'm going to need you here again. <clears throat> so I'm going to take you through the various stages that you have been through. And then we're going to continue on into retirement and beyond. Because I have had the privilege of working with people that are older than I am, or shall I say better than I am, even to the point of people literally being on their deathbed and still having me run around and try to put their things in order. And so I've learned a lot from my own history and past and experiences and the experiences of my senior adults as well. And so we're going to share that with you. So one thing I would like to do is go through our seasons of life. And this is where I'm going to need Carol. And this is, you guys were so great for that first shout out part. Please continue that. Some of my audiences just sit on their hands and I can't get them to say anything. So thank you for that so much. And so let's take your babyhood. When you were a small baby, this is before you, were, before you went to school. So babyhood, ch uh, toddlerhood, what are some things that you have in your house right now that you needed in that stage of your life? that season of your life. Raise your hand. What do you have? Over here. Oh, you, you got someone. I have my baby shoes. <clears throat> OK, we don't need a microphone over here. That girl's got some baby <laughs> shoes. <laughs> yes. Food, obviously different food, but food. OK, different foods you still have, OK. <laughs> I have my baby blanket. OK, baby blanket. If you want to shout your answer to Carol, she might be able to tell me back there. OK, the stocking they brought home from the day you were born. OK, well, I can really hear you back there. Either you got a big mouth or I've got good hearing. We'll just say I got good hearing. I'm sorry? Just clothing in general. So you have some baby, baby clothes. So when I go into people's homes, I'm finding the toys, you know, baby toys, high chairs, um, stuffed animals. We didn't say that one. Books, lots of baby books, things that you needed when you were a baby. So then we go on to a bit going into school. So from the time you started school to the time you ended school, and for those of you still in school, what do you have in your house right now that you needed during your school years that you no longer use, but you still have? Your yearbook? OK, got a yearbook? Pictures that we drew? My old school uniform. Her old school uniform? You sure you can't fit into that anymore? A backpack? A backpack, OK. Autograph book? A diary that I kept when I was... A diary. Oh, you got to keep that from your siblings. I used to read my sister's diary. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> did, I, did I have some things over her head? Old report cards. Old report cards, okay. I wouldn't read anybody's diary now, by the way. <laughs> but that was fun when I was a kid. So old report cards, okay. How about any textbooks? Just raise your hand if you have textbooks that you no longer need, but you need it at one time. OK, so some of you are holding out on me. You have some things in your house, um, and you're, you're not raising your hand on me. Thank you. How about school papers? 
reports and things that you wrote, okay. Yes, okay, sometimes I find school papers and they'll have a bad grade on them. So I'll pull out some, I said, you got a D plus on this math test. Why the heck are you saving a D plus paper? Crazy. I find things like dried prom flowers that are now all getting crumbled and everything from that era of when you went to those kind of dances. I find posters, I find collections like rock collections and bird nest collections, who knew? Spoon collections. How about sports equipment? Since we're talking about a sports theme today, I find sports equipment, I find trophies all the time from when you were younger. I find people's cast. Now I'm not saying cats, like an animal. Like you broke your arm, you got your cast cut off, and you said to the doctor, could I keep that? I want to put that in my closet for the next 20 some years until the organizer finds it. I find braces, people's braces, I find their molars all the time. I'm telling you, you people are stuffing stuff in your homes like crazy, and I uncover it all the time. So also graduation gowns. Those of us who have graduated, we still keep the darn gowns. What the heck are we doing with graduation gowns still? And like when my son graduated, he said, Mom, can I throw my hat up in the air? I'm like, please throw your hat up in the air and don't bring it back. Just have a great celebration with it. <clears throat> she, he said, because my uh, friend's mom said she's not allowed to throw the hat. I'm like, I think you know me well enough. You're allowed to throw the hat. So then we go on to careers. So for those of you who went on to have a career and you've changed careers or you've retired or you're a stay-at-home parent right now, what do you have in your homes right now that you, get up, Carol, she's ready, get, uh, that you need, right, that you no longer need but you still have in your homes? <clears throat> Let me hear it. Just yell it out. I might be able to hear you. So you have training manuals for a career you no longer have, okay? I didn't say that sarcastically, did I? Resource books. Sorry, I was losing my voice there. So nameplates and your career something, what did we say? Old awards for me. <clears throat> Old awards and plaques and your nameplate that was on your desk. How about business cards? Big stacks of business cards for who you used to be, not who you are now. Some of this stuff makes no sense to me. Uniforms. I find lots of different uniforms. I'm like, oh, you were a nurse. You were a doctor. You were in the military. I can, I can tell a lot about you. Over here, <clears throat> how, I find people that still have client records for clients they will never have again, such as real estate agent who, agents who used to sell homes. I find trade magazines and all those promotional items that you got when you were on the job and salespeople brought in, or you went to your own trade shows and you started picking those things up. And then for those in the room that got married, sometimes you come together and you have duplicates. Both of you have an ironing board and, and those kind of things. Does any married couple in here have duplicates of things in your home? Yes? I didn't hear you. Oh, an iron? So you have two irons, his and her iron? And who irons anymore? Who needs two irons? <laughs> when are you going to when are you going to be happy enough to pop that open? <laughs> like what are you waiting for? <laughs> On your deathbed, please bring me that. My husband has a bottle of Coke from a 1987 <laughs> team of his that won. Okay. That he has not opened, will not ever open. Okay. That, that's because that's accumulating money. That's your retirement money hidden in that bottle. You just have no idea. Okay. Books that they've already read. Still got those in there. Okay. Um, a lot of, how many people have your wedding dress? Okay. Did you plan on using that again? Just curious. <laughs> we can talk about that later. I find the champagne flutes and the bridal registry and all of those things still stuffed in your homes. And then for those of you who went on to have children, so I'm guessing that's a reason why some of you are here today, because you went to have, go on to have these special small packages of yours, um, we started collecting and accumulating things for our own children. 
So all of those things that you're saving that from your own childhood, you start saving for your own children, don't you? Only you save about 10 times more than what we saved for our own, for our, from our own childhood. And you guys save some really strange things sometimes. So I was helping a woman in her dining room, and I opened up her hutch, and I pulled out these three things, and I thought, these look really familiar, but I just can't pinpoint what they are. She goes, oh, those are my children's umbilical cords. <laughs> Am I a bad mom? I mean, it didn't even occur to me to keep my children's umbilical cords. I threw those things out right when they fell off. <laughs> Who knows? And so and then when you think about it, I was a little afraid of what else she might have been saving in that house, right? So I had to ask her the question. I said, well, let me ask you something. Do you have any sons, and have they been circumcised? <laughs> That's just inappropriate. I hope you didn't catch that on film there. <laughs> That's bad. I even I make myself blush on that one. I, need, I should stop doing that. So for our children, you know, they're musical instruments. Remember when they begged to play that musical instrument? And they played it for like, what, four or six weeks? And then they realized that was going to take some work and some homework to play that instrument. And so those are sitting in the closets and collecting dust and, and those kind of things. And then for some of you, well, maybe not in this room necessarily, but so, I work with empty nesters. Do I have any empty nesters in here? OK, we have a few empty nesters in here. So empty nesters tend to start, uh, have craft supplies <clears throat> uh, from projects they're going to start up again now that the kids are out. They have their kids' stuff still, because the kids are off living their clutter-free life while mom and dad continue to hang on to all of their things. So I don't really say you're an empty nester until all of their stuff has gone with them. And uh, I even find sometimes an empty nester's unopened wedding presents. So when he says champagne that hasn't been opened, I find gifts that they know what it is, but they, they have not opened those packages. Yes, sir. an idea. That's a nice find. <laughs> you would be... Yeah, because they were too old. I find money, checks, gift cards all the time in places that people have totally forgotten where they were. For one gentleman, when I left after a four-hour session, I found over $4,200 that he did not know existed between gift cards, checks, and all of that. I know. Who leaves that kind of money laying around? I know exactly if I would have $4,200 or not. We also go through unexpected phases sometimes where we lose a loved one. And so sometimes we have to move our car out of the garage and put all of their stuff right in our garage, right? Because we... It's as if, you know, if we throw their stuff away, it's like throwing our love away. And we know nothing could be further from the truth, but I get that. We get in that emotional thing, and we, we treat stuff equally as love when love is really with the person and still with you. So we go through those unexpected times when stuff starts entering our homes. And so I want you to start thinking of all of this stuff needing to go on a skid. So everything you shouted out to me, including those three umbilical cords I mentioned, have to go over here on this skid. And we're going to call that the skid of life, OK? And over here are your goals, the people that you want to see, the stuff that makes you happy, all that great stuff that's still on your bucket list. And you're always saying, someday, I want to do this stuff, and I'm going to get to do this stuff someday. Well, part of the problem is you have this skid of stuff. And you're pulling it, and you're dragging it, and you're looking over there. Yes, yeah, someday I'm going to do this. And you're just trying to deal with all this stuff all the time. And some of you not only have one skid of life, you have two and three skids of life. And they're just piling and piling and piling. And this is a history. This is who I used to be. And I keep wallering over here in who I used to be. And I keep saying, someday I'm going to get back to being over here. 
This is where I want you to start thinking differently about your things. Right now, you're seeing these things as treasures. I want you to start think, seeing them as anchors. Anchors that are weighing you down and keeping you from this happiness that you keep saying you're going to get to someday. You see, Jay, or the, and the gentleman I introduced earlier, Jay with the 96 square foot house, he has figured this out. He doesn't have any skids of life any longer, does he? He has life going on over here. And that's what I want you to do. I told you in the beginning of the presentation, if I can get you to start thinking differently about this stuff, I'm going to get you happier. We're going to be more confident. We're going to be living the life that we were meant to live and sharing that passion with people of things that we need and have for ourselves. And we're going to start sharing that with everyone else. When we're not burdened with these things. These were treasures. I get that. This may be a baby bed over here. I had a baby bed on my skid of life that I raised five children in. It's not my children, and it's not going to bring my babies back by holding on to those. I let those things go so that I can enjoy them and be in the moment now, and not some grouchy, stressed out, overwhelmed mother over here, because that's exactly what I'd be if I held on to all of those things. So I let those go things go out of love, and I bless other people with them. There's other people that are enjoying the things that were on my skid of life. These things serve their purpose for me, and now I'm going to let them go to serve their purpose for someone else. So living in your season, what season are you in now, and where are you trying to get to? What's your next season? I want you to surround yourself with the things that you need today and will move you forward and not keep you back in the long run. So let's look at one more thing here that people uh, tend to hang on to. <clears throat> on your skid of life, because this counts as a skid of life item. You hold on to things for strangers, OK? And you're thinking, no, I don't. But let me give you an example. I purchased a dishwasher not too long ago, and it came with dishwasher baskets. Are you familiar with these? OK, I get them in dishwashers. And my other one only had one when it broke. And I was given like four, five, six more of these with the new dishwasher. When I opened it up, it was full of baskets. And I thought, I pretty much been living with just one. I don't need all these baskets. So I rounded up the brand new baskets, and I went in the other room, and I put them in our donate bin. We have a definite donate bin in my home, and so everyone knows that's where you put the stuff you don't need. I made the mistake of not hiding them in the donate bin, because along comes my husband, and he sees these in the donate bin. And he goes, aren't these the brand new baskets that we just got in the dishwasher? Why would you give them away? And I said, well, you know, we've always been OK with one. I don't think we need any others. He goes, well, why don't we save these in case we need them someday? I said, well, we could do that, I suppose. He goes, because someday you know, the people who buy our house might want them. <laughs> and I said, are we selling our house? Because I didn't know anything about we selling our house. He wanted me to go put these down and save this for the stranger who will be buying my house someday. <laughs> I said, how about if we bless a stranger with them now and give them away now? Because I sold real estate, and never in my years of selling real estate did I have anyone walk in the door and go, those dishwater baskets better be there. I'm not buying this place. <laughs> okay, not once did that ever happen to me. So I said, we can, you know, we can save them. But you know what it really reminds me of is it just makes me want to have more babies, because this is for baby bottles. He dropped that thing like a hot cake and said, <laughs> you go right ahead and donate those, and don't ever bring those back into this house. How many of you remodel your house, and you take those scratched up old brass knobs off of a, you know, some cabinets in the kitchen, and you put up nice, beautiful nickel color, whatever's in style for, the, for the, this year, this season? And you take these scratched up old knobs and you put them in a Ziploc bag and you go put them in the garage or down in the basement. Why are you saving these? Because someday when someone buys your house, they're going to want to go down in the basement and go, oh, I am so glad they saved these scratched up knobs that have the finish worn off. I was looking for these and I was hoping that I could put these back on the cabinet. So some of you are even saving things for strangers as we go. So it's no wonder you're feeling overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. 
You're not even saving things for just this season of your life. You're saving things from past seasons, a future season, strangers, and then of course we've got one more season, your fantasy season. Okay, your fantasy season is when you open your closet and you have clothes in there that are several sizes, much too small for you, that you fit in many, many years ago. Because someday you're going to get back into those clothes, right? That's why you save all of them in your closet all the time. And of course, as I go down into your basement, I find this VHL tape called Buns of Steel. <laughs> and you're going to use that ab cruncher that you bought late at night one time and your Buns of Steel to get back into those clothes that you have in your closet. You're in your fantasy season right now. What about all you that are cutting out those recipes, right? You're going to make those dishes someday, so you stuff those recipes in that kitchen drawer again. I get people pointing to each other during the fantasy season part here. You're going to make those recipes someday, OK? You take your grandma's china, you take your mom's china, you've got your own china, because someday, what, you're going to have a party for 75 people? You've got to make sure everyone has china, even though whenever you entertain, you always pull out the paper plates. Someday, you're living in a fantasy season. I need you to let go of that fantasy season and start living in this season. You're over here in the fantasy season because the fantasy season feels so good. You fixed that car up that you've been saving all those parts for. You've got all your pictures organized that you, what you're going to do. And all those clothes that you said you were going to fit into fit into you again. You're in your fantasy season. And so when I asked you to get rid of those things, it's like, Darn, I'm just my regular old self again now, not the fantasy season person. But that's OK. When you accept who you are and you support who you are, you're going to be a whole lot happier than having things to support as someone you are not in the long run. Because all of that fantasy season stuff has to sit right here on these skids that you are dragging and pulling, trying to get to your goals in the long run. So all that stuff that you are holding, that are you holding on to is keeping you from enjoying your current season. Please figure out tonight on your drive home, talk with someone and tell them who, you know, what your favorite season is. Who are you today and where are you trying to get to? And share with them what you're going to let go of in order to uh, live your season of life. So I'm going to totally lose control of the room here for a minute. But when I ask for you to come back, I need you to come back. It's OK that you get really noisy here for a minute. I want you to turn to someone right now and tell them something that you're going to let go of off the skid of life that you're going to part with and you're going to donate for someone else to use. Go, tell someone next to you. OK, I need you to come back. Come back, come back. Everyone back to the room up here. Someone flashed the lights. I don't know. Yeah, if, yeah, come on, teachers in the room. Help me here. If you can hear me, clap once. Isn't, yeah, 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 you got it. OK. So how about shouting out to me? Don't tell me what you, your neighbor told you that they're going to get rid of. Shout out to me something that you're going to let go of. Christmas decorations. What did you say? Old references. Old references, OK. The D plus, do they have D pluses on them? <laughs> OK, got it, got it, got it. Textbooks. The 50 pound Bible. OK. That doesn't mean you're going to start being a bad boy, though, right? Who else? What are you going to get let go of? Old clothes. old clothes. OK. So let's get the old clothes, the textbooks, the references, the 50-pound Bible. Old toys. Old toys. They're going to. Someone else is going to get to benefit from all of those things, including our environment. 
When you start letting go of all these things, our environment is going to be healthier as well. So you're not going to help someone else. You're going to help yourself by helping the environment that you live on. I told you I'm going to lose control. You guys just can't stop talking. Some of you have a very long list of stuff you're going to let go of. We can continue that conversation another time. So I want you to remember that everything in your home costs you something. Space, time, or money. It will cost you space in your attics, in your garages, in your basements, in your homes, in your master closet. It will take up space. It will cost you money. Because what do you do when you have too much stuff? You buy storage containers, right? And you stuff them all, and you put labels on it, and you buy more storage containers because that wasn't enough. And then you buy shelves to store the storage containers on. And then you complain to your spouse that your house is too small. You need to either build another room on or you need to upgrade your house to a bigger house because you got all this stuff that you need to store, right? So it's going to cost money to do that. If you decide to move, it's going to cost you more money to move those things overall. And then, of course, it's going to cost you time. Time to deal with it, fix it, dust it, move it, move it again, unpack it, repack it. You're going to spend your time over here. So everything you bring into your home will cost you time, space, or money, and sometimes all three. Now, I want you to think about something for me. Even free items, free items that people give you will cost you space, time, or money. Please remember that as you go to these kind of trade shows and you start filling those canvas bags with all of that stuff. All of that stuff is going to cost you space, time, and money. Make sure that it's worth it. Make sure that it's helping you reach your goals over here and not something that's almost going to be immediately tossed over here in the skid of life. So free items have a cost. Now, as an organizer, I also see hidden cost happening as well. So I have spouses who fight over things. I've had to literally break them up before and say, I want you over here, and I want you over here, and I want you to tell me right now what you're fighting about. And he will say, well, she has all that, she's taken up an entire room with craft items, and I haven't seen one craft coming out of that room yet. <laughs> and over here she'll say, well, how about those four tires that you, have parked, that you have in the garage where I can't even park my car for that car you're going to work on someday, and you haven't touched that car you're going to work on someday. And they start going at it after that. So I have to break them up again, and I say, I want you to stop for just a minute. Do you realize you guys are arguing over stuff? You are damaging your relationship right now over some craft supplies and some tires. Is it worth it? Are those two things worth bringing you apart right now? Because they are. Okay, I want you to realize there's a hidden cost with your relationship. Have you ever yelled at a child to clean their room? I'm just guessing this has happened to you. Okay. So we're over here yelling and arguing, the other spouse gets involved, and we're all fussing at one another. And when I separate all of you guys and I find out what you've been arguing about, it all boils down to stuff. You guys have been stressed, frustrated, angry, cussing sometimes over too much stuff. Let's stop damaging our relationships over too much stuff in the long run. Some of it's costing you socially, too. You don't just want to have people over to your house pop in, do you? No way. You don't want people to pop in, and therefore they don't. And they don't because they don't want you popping in on them either. And so socially, we're not just stopping in for a cup of tea unannounced anymore. People used to do that. My mom used to do that with the neighbor ladies regularly. And we don't do it at all, so it's costing us socially. And then, of course, we have emotional pain sometimes. We have things in our homes that make us feel bad. Does anyone have any unread magazines that have been collecting dust for a while? And when you look at that pile, what do you think? What are you thinking? Shout it out to me. What do you think when you see a pile of unread magazines? 
wish I had more time, so poor me, I don't have enough time. Or, wow, I spent so much money on these things. I haven't even gotten to them. So you never go, Yahoo, I'm glad all those magazines are unread there. I can't wait to dig in someday. No, they always make you feel bad. What would happen if you went home after this conference and you let go of every unread magazine that you have right now? How would that make you feel? It's like, yeah, that would make me feel really good. And then I had um, my mother, I took care of my mother towards the end of her life. She had cancer. And um, there'd be days, you know, she was ready to go. And so she would wake up some days and she'd say, Lori, why didn't the angels take me last night? I'm ready. And that's a tearjerker every time I, she'd wake up and she would say that to me. And I'd give her some explanation, you know. Clearly he doesn't need you quite yet or maybe want you quite yet. So I have to keep you. But uh, she would say that. So I shared that with a neighbor of mine. I said, you know, my mom wakes up and she says, she keeps asking me why the angels haven't taken her, that she's ready, and I don't know what to tell her. And so when she finally did pass, my neighbors presented me with this beautiful angel. And on the angel it said, right on the front of it, it said, when tomorrow starts without me, try to understand. An angel came and called my name and took me by the hand. Okay, it was the perfect gift for me, right? The angel taking her by the hand, it was the perfect gift. And so I um, put it on my mantle. I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much, the perfect gift. And I would walk into my house, I'd be all happy, and then I'd look at the mantle. And I'd have to go over there and read that darn poem again. Even though I knew what it said, I'd read it. And then I'm like, you know, honey, I don't feel like making dinner. I just, I'm just going to go ahead and go to bed. I just don't feel good. And I noticed I kept doing that over and over again. But I couldn't get rid of the angel. My friends gave it to me. They meant, it meant so much. So I thought, I'm just going to put it down in the basement. We haven't finished basement. I'll just put it down there. And so I'd come home all happy, and I'd walk by the basement door. And I knew she was down there. I didn't have to see her. I knew that angel was down there. And by this time, I'd read the poem so much, I knew what it said. And I'd go, bring me down again. And so my sister from Boston visited one time, and her bedroom's down there in the basement. That's where I put her. And <laughs> she likes it. And so she's down there, and she comes up one morning. And she goes, I love that angel. Did someone give you that after mom passed away? Because she knew the story, too. I'm like, did you say you love the angel? She goes, yes, I love the angel. I said, can you please take her home? She's like, oh, I couldn't do that. I won't, no, you need to keep her. I said, please, take her home. And so she did for me. She understood, and she let, it, let the angel go. I don't need the angel to remember my mother, and I don't need the angel to remember my neighbors did such an awesome gift for me that year. I don't need the angel to know that. Those memories are right here with me. And so I let the angel go because they were causing, it was causing me emotional pain in my very own home. So some of you, if you walk around your home, you have things that bring you down. Don't have things that bring you down. Those things are just mementos. They're not the memory in the long run. As I just told this story without seeing the angel. And now when I go to Boston, I know exactly where that darn angel is on my, on my um, sister's shelf as well. So I avoid that area when I can. So life is for living, not for having. Do you want a life of having? Or do you want a life of living? It is your decision, and it's such an easy thing when you really think about it to let those things go and start surrounding yourself with the things that you love and need today moving forward. So very quickly, a way to help you with this, I'm going to give you some questions, and you should have these questions on your handouts as well. I'm just going to go over them with you real quick. So these questions are not only for helping you get organized, but stay organized. They're also to be used maybe when you go shopping and you think about buying that very next thing. You might want to have these questions with you. So what's the worst thing that would happen if you let go of the item? What's the worst thing that would happen? If this item were missing, would I replace it? So if I took that promotional free coffee mug away, <laughs> that's funny. Would you go buy that promotional coffee mug again? He's like, no, who would do that? So why are you holding on to it in the first place if you wouldn't replace it? 
Can I find this information or item someplace else? I love books. I don't own a lot of books. They're heavy. I have to dust them. I don't like dusting. I go to the library or the internet to get the information that I need. Library will give me books day and night. Does this item help me reach my goals? If it's not helping me reach my goals, it must go. Life is too short. I still have goals I want to reach in the long run. And do I feel energized when I look at this item? You people with those unread magazines do not feel energized when you look at them. Let them go and you're going to feel liberated, let alone energized. <clears throat> so where are you going to start? You've got to start somewhere. On your drive home from this conference, are you going to start thinking about who am I and what do I really need and what can I donate off this skid of life so I can lighten this up as much as I can? Are you going to start looking over those questions as you go through your various rooms in your house? making decisions on what you should keep and what's okay to let go of. And remember, there's no, uh, the greatest mistake, mistake is to do nothing because you can only do a little. I know you people have busy lives. We all do. So I just want you to go home and do what you can. The next time you're putting on your makeup, look around. What kind of makeup have I just been holding on to? For what purpose? I'm going to let that go. The next time you're pulling a book off the bookshelf, what other books can go? Do this little letting go a little at a time if you don't have the time. All of that little time will add up overall. And remember, life is a journey. It changes with your age, the people you meet, like the people in this room, and the life circumstances. You are constantly changing. Make sure your stuff is keeping up with you and not letting it, not letting it drag you down in the long run. Uh, you have evaluations on your table today. If you would like to sign up for my newsletter, I do a monthly e-newsletter where I give you some more of this advice, solutions, and uh, motivation, because that's what you need more than anything else is this motivational uh, piece and this emotional piece. You can sign up for that on the bottom of my newsletter. You can just leave them on your table. We'll collect those um, after you leave. Also, uh, so you'll get a business tip. You'll get a residential tip. I am a writer. I'm a columnist writing an organizing column. Because you don't get the Dayton Daily newspaper, I'll put those articles that I wrote uh, in the paper in my newsletter as well for you. And I'll let you know where I'm teaching any of the classes, especially if you happen to live in my area. So I would love to connect with you. We don't sign you up unless you sign yourself up on those evaluations. <clears throat> and so I started this program with people waste 55 minutes a day for looking for things they own but cannot find. After listening to this talk and you start tossing the stuff and you're able to find what you need so much quicker, how are you going to start spending seven hours a week? Because that's what you're going to get to do when you figure this out in the long run. So I ask you, who's up for the challenge of getting more organized? Say aye. aye. I want to hear it louder. Aye. I am ready for the challenge to get more organized. Thank you again, Sean, for inviting me. And thanks for you for all your smiling faces. I appreciate it. Good luck to you.